Throughout human history, people have tried to create utopia, the perfect society. In fact, America, the American dream, in some sense, was based on utopianism. Though the word utopia has several meanings, the concept of a utopia consists of two basic elements, the first being socio-political, and the second relies on the physical aspects. So let's start out by analyzing utopias in art. The purpose of utopian art is to inspire its audience to work toward these goals of a pleasing and purposeful aesthetic, thus taking a step closer toward the ideal place. When it comes to analyzing utopian art, you've got to keep in mind that these ideas are only the artist's representation of what a utopia should be. Utopias depicted in art often share several traits. These traits are a flourishing environment, creative architecture that offers a unique perspective to utilizing space, and an array of efficient means of public and personal transport. Our perceived notion of a utopia had to start somewhere, so let's look back at a few guys who have made an impact on how we imagine utopian societies today. First up, we've got Ebenezer Howard. In 1898, Ebenezer Howard had a vision for a utopian city where the people lived harmoniously together with nature. He called his utopian vision Garden City. These garden cities would be compact, efficient, healthful, and beautiful, luring people away from swollen cities. The countryside would be dotted with hundreds of new communities where small-scale operations and direct democracy would flourish. Next, there's the Corbusier. In order to deal with the Parisian slums during World War I, he came up with the idea of Radiant City. Radiant City would utilize a series of towering apartment complexes that were built around the center of the city. He believed that his new modern architectural forms would provide an organizational solution that would raise the quality of life for lower classes. Architect Frank Lloyd Wright conceptualized an idea he called Broad Acre City. This concept developed from Frank Lloyd Wright's thought that people should have as much land as they need. Communities within Broad Acre City would be spread out, heavily relying on decentralization, meaning that residents of Broad Acre City would grow their own food on their land and goods would be manufactured in small factories. I think it was the nature of the human being to love and desire beauty and to do its best to live in it. While Ebenezer Howard, Le Corbusier, and Frank Lloyd Wright have shaped the way urbanists and architects think today, let's check out some other creative minds who are inspiring smart cities today. Let's first take a look at Walt Disney and his original idea for Epcot. What's now an amusement park started off as a creative community that encouraged new ideas and different ways of thinking. The most exciting, the far, the most important part of our Florida project, in fact, the heart of everything we'll be doing in Disney World will be our experimental prototype city of tomorrow. We call it Epcot. We don't presume to know all the answers. In fact, we're counting on the cooperation of American industry to provide their very best thinking during the planning and the creation of our experimental prototype community of tomorrow. And most important of all, when Epcot has become a reality and we find the need for technologies that don't even exist today, it's our hope that Epcot will stimulate American industry to develop new solutions that will meet the needs of people expressed right here in this experimental community. No city of today will serve as the guide for the city of tomorrow. Epcot will be a planned environment demonstrating to the world what American communities can accomplish through proper control of planning and design. Epcot begins with an idea new among cities built since the birth of the automobile. We call it the radio plan. A network of transportation systems radiate from the central hub, carrying people to and from the heart of the city. 
These transportation systems circulate to and through four primary spheres of activity surrounding the central core. First, the area of business and commerce. Next, the high-density apartment housing. Then, the broad green belt and recreation lands. And finally, the low-density neighborhood residential streets. Here, the Disney staff will work with individual companies to create a showcase of industry at work. In attractive park-like settings, the six million people who visit Disney World each year will look behind the scenes at experimental prototype plants, research and development laboratories, and computer centers for major corporations. So this is Epcot, the heart of Disney World. In other parts of the country, a community the size of this prototype could become part of an entire city complex composed of many such communities, planned and built a few miles apart. In Disney World, about 20,000 people will actually live in Epcot. Their homes will be built in ways that permit ease of change so that new products may continuously be demonstrated. Their schools will welcome new ideas so that everyone who grows up in Epcot will have skills in pace with today's world. Epcot will be a working community with employment for all. And everyone who lives here will have a responsibility to help keep this community an exciting, living blueprint of the future. Now, a Florida man with a vision of tomorrow, today. For nearly all of his 86 years, architect Jacques Fresco has been designing cities of the future. Fresco's structures all derive from a simple form that fascinated him as a boy. When I was about 12 years old, I was looking at a gear on the table, and I saw the cities of the future. I think all inventions are based upon experiences like that. I don't think they come out of nowhere. Fresco believes that civilization will be forced to colonize the sea if land becomes uninhabitable. The Earth can only support so many people comfortably. And if the population exceeds the capacity of the land, we're going to have to move seaward and build cities throughout the sea. Working from his Florida studio, Fresco has spent decades making detailed drawings of his futuristic ocean cities. He also builds prototypes, experimenting continually with new materials. He even lives in one. Fresco's even developed plans for transporting his structures out to sea. They'll be constructed out of modular sections, assembled on land by robots, and then towed to their final ocean destinations. Other structures will be made from high-tech materials called memory metal. These memory metals can be distorted, twisted, pulled out of shape. And then when a certain temperature is provided, that memory metal goes right back to its original shape. So buildings made from memory metals can be compressed into small cubes for towing and then snapped back to size upon arrival. And almost instantaneously, you will see a building erected before your eyes, and no humans working on it at all. Fresco's vision goes beyond architecture. He sees his cities as tools for fostering humanistic values. I feel that environment shapes our values, the people we know, the people we identify with. What will drive people in the future? A world without war, without hatred, without bigotry, without prejudice. The future must 
extend an invitation for all people to join in because the problems affect everybody. One small step for men, one big step out of society. Arcosanti, small in its being, big in its beliefs. Creator of these beliefs is architect Paolo Soleri. In the 60s he created the idea to build a harmonious city which would be harmless to the environment. Everything had to be based on Soleri's philosophies. Paolo Soleri planted the seed, you know, back in the 70s in my head, is how to have a connection between the natural environment and the built environment. Even if I failed in applying this notion, in developing a, a prototype or whatever, I, somebody is going to pick it up after me. In your lifetime, you think? Well, it doesn't matter that much. Wright and Soleri had a deep, deep connection to the Arizona desert. They took from it different lessons, they used it in somewhat different ways, but they each had, in their own way, a very profound love for that land and a desire to express that love in their architecture. I, I thought this guy was onto something, you know, when he got a little bit into his arcology. And the people were really willing to obey my orders. Also because I was mixing with them and we were working together. So that's how Arcosanti got established. legacy will be as, as a, an architectural futurist. I would say that Arcosanti has to be experienced to be understood, that all of the pictures and all of the conversations in the world don't do for you what actually walking through it does. Now that we've got the chance to see some of the physical plans of several utopian concepts, let's look at the socio-political side of utopia. One of the most striking and painful facts about human history is that societies can get stuck. They can have a pattern of behavior that persists long after it's become clear to everybody that this pattern is harmful, it's holding everyone back. The challenge is how to give people in that situation a mechanism to escape from that trap and make real progress. The Charter Cities Initiative is a framework for reform. Our role at NYU in encouraging the development of entirely new cities, charter cities, is to give countries the confidence to undertake a reform that they think will be beneficial, but is difficult to carry out broadly for the entire society. We have this unique opportunity to do this at the city scale because there's so many people moving into cities in the next hundred years. To put this in perspective, we've spent 10,000 years getting to a point where we've got about 3.5 billion people living in cities now. In the next 100 years, we will add another 5 billion people to that number. That 100-year window gives us a unique chance to use urbanization and guide it in ways that generate true progress. This is a picture of, of William Penn, who was a Quaker dissident who was given the area that's now known as Pennsylvania. He imagined that it was possible to develop an entirely new city here in North America. So he created a charter that guaranteed the legal right to freedom of conscience, and he recruited a bunch of people who believed in this concept. 
That struck many people as inconceivable as a model that could work, but he demonstrated it. It then became a place that many immigrants from Europe went to, and then other cities started to copy the freedom of religion in Pennsylvania because they too wanted to attract all of those immigrants. If the challenge that William Penn faced was to encourage freedom, freedom of conscience, the challenge that faced reformers in uh, China was how to take a society which at one time had been among the leaders in income and technology and which for centuries had fallen further and further behind. One of the most important steps that the reformers undertook was to create some special zones and one was truly unique. In Shenzhen, the Chinese government tried some policies to allow the market to decide where people could work, to allow foreign firms to come in and work with Chinese firms, work with uh, Chinese workers. The government could experiment with those reforms without forcing them on anybody who feared them or was suspicious about those reforms. Shenzhen shows that a startup city can prototype a whole different set of reforms and laws and that those can then spread throughout a nation. You have to have a mechanism and a strategy for changing not just the laws, but the norms that have to support those laws. The mechanism that we need is one based on three principles. You need to start with a charter, and it's got to guarantee first the principles of reform that you want to implement in a place. We came up with a phrase of a charter city. The term charter comes from the charter that Penn wrote for Pennsylvania and it suggests a strategy of using the Constitution, the commitment to principles, to attract people who have a shared vision and who can build a new community. So the city could start by enunciating the key principles that would organize life there. You also need a commitment in the Charter to the principle of choice and mobility. The reforms will have legitimacy in the eyes of the people who live there if they made a decision to move there and live under those rules. And finally, equal treatment under the law. Because if part of what you're trying to do is create a culture that's shared, that everyone believes in. It's like that culture of freedom in uh, Pennsylvania, the culture of market choice, market opportunity in Shenzhen. Everybody has to have a stake in those norms in that culture. The big picture is that charter cities will speed up progress. But at human scale, what a charter city means is new opportunities, new choices for families. When the father from Bangladesh has to go to Dubai and be treated as a third-class citizen to earn some money to send home for his kids, something's wrong. The world should be creating those opportunities for those families to have good jobs, but to remain as an intact family. All throughout history, people have moved because they could imagine a better life for their children. And the ultimate indicator of success would be if every family in the world felt like there were many cities that were actively competing to have them as residents. So they could choose to go to the one that best expressed their ambitions, their hopes. While Paul Romer focuses on the economic side of cities, Designer William McDonough believes changes in cities need to start with the way we design them. There is no end game. Uh, there's an infinite game, and we're playing in that infinite game. And so we call it cradle to cradle. And our goal is very simple. This is what I presented to the White House. Our goal is a delightfully diverse, safe, healthy, and just world with clean air, clean water, soil, and power, economically, equitably, ecologically, and elegantly enjoyed, period. We're doing 12 cities for China right now based on cradle to cradle as templates. Our assignment is to develop protocols for the housing 400 million people in 12 years. We did a mass energy balance. If they use brick, they will lose all their soil and burn all their coal. They'll have cities with no energy and no food. These are our cities. We're building a new city next to this city. Look at that landscape. This is the site. We don't normally do green fields, but this one uh, is about to be built. So they brought us in to intercede. This is their plan. It's a rubber stamp grid that they laid right on that landscape, and they brought us in and said, what would you do? This is what they would end up with, which is another color photograph. 
so this is the existing site. So this is what it looks like now, and here's our proposal. So the way we approach this is we study the hydrology very carefully. We study the biota, the ancient biota, the current farming, and, and the protocols. We study the winds and the sun to make sure everybody in the city will have uh, fresh air, fresh water, and uh, a, a direct sunlight in every single apartment at some point during the day. We then take the parks and lay them out as the ecological infrastructure. We lay out the building areas. We start to integrate commercial mixed use so the people all have centers and places to be. The transportation is all very simple. Everybody's within five minute walk of mobility. We have 24 hour street so that there's always a place that's alive. Uh, the waste systems all connect. If you flush a toilet, uh, your feces will go to the sewage treatment plants which are sold as assets, not liabilities because who wants the fertilizer factory that makes natural gas? The waters are all taken into constructed wetlands for habitat restorations, and then it makes natural gas, which then goes back into the city uh, to power the fuel for the cooking uh, for the city. So this is, these are fertilizer gas plants. And then the compost is all taken back to the roofs of the city where we've got farming, because what we've done is lifted up uh, the city, uh, the, the landscape into the air to uh, to restore the native landscape on the roofs of the buildings. The solar power of all the factory centers and all the industrial zones with their light roofs powers the city. And this is the concept for the top of the city. We've lifted the earth up onto the roofs. The farmers have little bridges to get from one roof to the next. We inhabit the city with work-live space on all the ground floors. And so this is the existing city and this is the new city. So now we've got these two ideas that covers the economic structure of a good city and the physical design aesthetic. But what other factors play a role in making a good city? One of the key elements of great cities, there are two key elements really, a great city is a place of great streets and intimate, small, interesting little parks like the Mears one or something like that. So one of the things is really, again, this stitching together for example, in the corridors, bridging the gaps between those nice spots, but there's often lots of gaps between them in one way or another. So great streets, this happens to be a Paris street, it doesn't matter, but any city you go to, you'll probably see that it's a great street that makes you feel good about the city. Because what are cities about? Cities are about the reason for being is to meet to talk and do things together, to transact, to create business, develop products and service in all other sorts of things, as well as, of course, to have fun in some sort of way. That's the essence of what cities are about. Survival at one level, but also layering something on top of that survival that we all need, that create in creates interest, bonding, and so on. And then the final area is creative city making. Many people think it's purely about art. And of course, art is incredibly important. And we want good art, of course. We don't want boring art. Not every bit of art is great, but much of it is. We want that, of course, important, significant, a different sort of insight. It reminds us that we can look at things in a different way. It can stimulate us. And then there's the creative economy, which is those industries of the imagination, which are driving very much wealth creation and so on, design, new media, variations of music and so on. You know all about that. And then there's the third version of what a creative city might mean, which is saying we need a creative class. This is Richard Florida's office, who wrote the book The Rise of the Creative Class, which includes those people who are knowledge workers and all of that. And that may be, in St. Paul's, 25% of people. But there's a more interesting question. What about the other 75%? Because the creativity we're talking about is, in a sense, more than purely the artistic, although we want that desperately at the center of these matters, of course. It's also about administrative creativity, social innovations, all forms of other innovations. It's about basically creating the conditions where ordinary people can make the extraordinary happen if given the chance, because there's an enabling environment. And there's an environment also which says, is this woman ugly and old and wrinkled, or is she wonderful? 
Are we going to use and harness her potential? That's also creativity. And that's the culture of creativity one wants to engender in a place like St. Paul's. It's something where we're crossing boundaries, where different people with different skills are coming together in order to jointly do something that wouldn't be achieved if they did it on their own. Charles Landry mentions the idea of a creative class. This means more creative jobs to fit our future. The world that we are creating very quickly, we're going to see more and more things that look like science fiction and fewer and fewer things that look like jobs. Our cars are very quickly going to start driving themselves, which means we're going to need fewer truck drivers. We're going to hook Siri up to Watson and use that to automate a lot of the work that's currently done by customer service reps and troubleshooters and diagnosers. And we're already taking R2-D2, painting him orange, and putting him to work carrying shelves around warehouses, which means we need a lot fewer people to be walking up and down those aisles. Now, for about 200 years, people have been saying exactly what I'm telling you, that the age of technological unemployment is at hand, starting with the Luddites smashing looms in Britain just about two centuries ago. And they have been wrong. Our economies in the developed world have coasted along on something pretty close to full employment, which brings up a critical question, why is this time different if it really is? The reason it's different is that just in the past few years, our machines have started demonstrating skills they have never, ever had before. Understanding, speaking, hearing, seeing, answering, writing, and they're still acquiring new skills. For example, mobile humanoid robots are still incredibly primitive, but the research arm of the Defense Department just launched a competition to have them do things like this. And if the track record is any guide, this competition is going to be successful. So when I look around, I think the day is not too far off at all when we're going to have androids doing a lot of the work that we are doing right now. And we're creating a world where there is going to be more and more technology and fewer and fewer jobs. It's a world that Eric Brynjolfsson and I are calling the new machine age. The thing to keep in mind is that this is absolutely great news. This is the best economic news on the planet these days. Not that there's a lot of competition, right? <laughs> this is the best economic news we have these days for two main reasons. The first is technological progress is what allows us to continue this amazing recent run that we're on, where output goes up over time, while at the same time, prices go down, and volume and quality just continue to explode. Now, some people look at this and talk about shallow materialism, but that's absolutely the wrong way to look at it. This is abundance, which is exactly we, what we want our economic system to provide. The second reason that the new machine age is such great news is that once the androids start doing jobs, we don't have to do them anymore, and we get freed up from drudgery and toil. Now, when I talk about this with my friends in Cambridge and Silicon Valley, they say, fantastic, no more drudgery, no more toil. This gives us the chance to imagine an entirely different kind of society, a society where the creators and the discoverers and the performers and the innovators come together with their patrons and their financiers to talk about issues, entertain, enlighten, provoke each other. It's a society, really, that looks a lot like the TED conference. And there's actually a huge amount of truth here. We are seeing an amazing flourishing taking place in a world where it is just about as easy to generate an object as it is to print a document. We have amazing new possibilities. The people who used to be craftsmen and hobbyists are now makers and they're responsible for massive amounts of innovation. And artists who are formerly constrained can now do things that were never ever possible for them before. The main message of my work over the past decade or more ha has been a fairly basic message, and that's that every single human being is creative. Uh, but then, as with anything, one has to put statistical parameters around what that means. And, and what I found is that in the United States and around the world, our society is really dividing into people who are principally paid to use their creativity at work and those who, who may be quite creative but are they're principally paid to use their physical labor or they're involved in low-skill service work. In, in any event, um, there are about 40 million Americans who are privileged to be members of what I call the creative class. There are people in science and technology, 
Uh, there are people who are entrepreneurs who work in research and development. They're architects. They're designers. They work in arts and culture, the entertainment and media. And then the kind of classic knowledge-based professionals that, that great management thinkers like Peter Drucker taught us about. People in business and management and healthcare and law and education. Uh, right now in the United States, it's about 35 percent of the workforce. But what's, what's interesting is through the terrible economic crisis we've had, while rates of unemployment for manufacturing workers went over 15 percent, in some cases over 20 percent, and for people who do low-skill service work like food preparation or personal care, uh, that kind of work went well over 10 percent. The, the rate of unemployment amongst the creative class never went higher than 5 percent. And you know we're on track to generate another 7 million of these jobs over the course of the next decade. And, and in the most advanced regions of the countries, places like San Francisco or the Silicon Valley or Boulder, Colorado or Austin, Texas or Seattle or Boston, Raleigh, Durham, Washington, DC, there might have been 35 or 40 percent. Now in some of these regions, almost 50 percent of the workforce, we're sitting in Manhattan today and in New York County, which is Manhattan, it's nearly half of the workforce is already in this creative class. And we, we have been able to look around the world. And we, I added a whole new chapter on that in this book. You know, in some countries like Singapore, or in Sweden, or in Norway, or in Denmark, the Netherlands, already more than 45 to 50 percent of the workforce is doing this kind of creative class work. So in, in my view, it's, it's the growth force of our time and the real challenge ahead of us is how do we get more and more people involved in creative class work, using their minds, using their creativity, because it will afford them a better salary, it'll improve productivity, and it'll, it'll hopefully begin to address the terrible inequality we face in our country. Today, more than half of the world's population lives in cities. The rapid and complex urbanization process raises many consequences for our societies at the social, economic, environmental, and cultural levels. In response, cities are enhancing their creative and innovative entrepreneurial potential. Increasing use of social media and digital technologies boost cultural diversity as well as build new bridges for global cooperation. In this context, cities are playing a vital role in harnessing creativity for socioeconomic development and dialogue within and between societies. Since 2004, UNESCO has been gathering cities to share experiences in seven fields of creative industries. Literature, film, music, crafts and folk art, design, media arts, and gastronomy. This global platform aims to give visibility to the city members and encourages them to establish international development partnerships in creative industries. Today, more than 30 cities from different continents have joined the UNESCO Creative Cities Network. The network is open to cities that wish to highlight their assets in the field of creative industries while sharing knowledge and practices across cultural clusters around the world. The growing momentum reflected by this global network confirms that cities have become key actors to promote cultural diversity and dialogue, as well as to create new opportunities for development through unique forms of partnerships. The whole purpose of a city is to open up opportunities and possibilities, to open up ways of communication. Songdo, South Korea is capturing the world's attention. A newly constructed city it combines cutting-edge urban planning with an infrastructure built on state-of-the-art network technology. Developers hope Songdo will attract companies wanting to do business in the region. It's already transforming the way people work and providing a model for other cities everywhere. Today, the world holds seven billion people. Within the next 50 years, that number may climb to 9 billion. 
the need to make existing cities more energy efficient and to build new sustainable cities is on the rise. Across the globe, developers are building smart cities, offering high quality, eco-friendly living. One of the most ambitious is South Korea's $35 billion Songdo International Business District. South Korea is one of the world's most densely populated countries. When the Songdo project began in 2001, there was no available land to build it. 1,500 acres had to be reclaimed from the sea. Today, some of the world's best planners, architects, builders, and technology companies are creating Songdo from the ground up. By 2016, more than 400 new buildings will stand, including South Korea's tallest skyscraper. We took an approach that has the best elements of some of the finest cities in the world. 40% of the space is open space. You can leave your car at home, and you can walk to Central Park, you can walk your child to school. You can visit an office or a retail shopping center. You can go to the golf course, all within walking distance. Yeah,뭔가 The design of the buildings is something you don't see anywhere here in Korea. And we've got state-of-the-art technology going into our buildings. The network that we deploy here is actually connecting all of the components in the city. You know, all of the residences, offices, schools, everywhere, all of the buildings. In this networked community, residents will be able to control the functions of their homes remotely and everyone will be able to interact through video from anywhere. New and old technology working together will create a truly sustainable city. We didn't just look 10 years ahead. We looked at 50 years, 100 years from now. If the city achieves half the things that we planned from the start, the quality of life will be unmatched. Songdo is being studied by many countries, many mayors many governors uh, as an example of a smart and connected community and a more efficient way of organizing urban living. We're hoping we contribute to the global footprint in a positive way. Songdo is one of more than a hundred smart city projects underway worldwide. Well indeed this is the start of a fully sustainable city. This is Mazda city in Abu Dhabi. Mazda is the Arabic word for source. The project was started in 2006 and phase one, a million square meters, will be completed by 2015. The plan is for the entire city to be powered by renewable energy and the project will be finished in 2025 when it will be home to over 40,000 people. So I want to find out what they're doing and what they hope to achieve. Christopher, we're in a, a an atmosphere now that most people in Northern Europe would think this is where solar panels would work. So is the long-term plan, Christopher, to make the, the, the city self-sufficient effectively or, or generate enough energy to run the whole city? Is that the long-term plan? The interesting thing is that you have to, in order to do that, the whole experiment here, the whole work and the progress of, of the Mastar City uh, installation is to match demand to supply. And we learn each time we build a new building, each time we do a technology, how to do that better and better and better all the time. We're really trying to be the front runner for the region on how to produce energy in a sustainable way right. and how to build buildings and create technology in the buildings so that you can match the way you use energy to how much energy you actually have. And this is really the whole trick of being sustainable and having a green city. Uh, today, we use a lot of passive techniques in order to minimize the cooling energy we have to use, for example. So the buildings are closer, so they create shade. Uh, the rooftop PV creates shade for the building as well. And we orient the whole city so as to capture the prevailing winds and use those for cooling effects. And in fact, if you stand in the middle of Master City and compare that to downtown Abu Dhabi, we're 10 degrees Celsius cooler wow. than, than a spot in Abu Dhabi. And that's a lot of energy to save. So the combination of doing everything the right way actually gets you the point of carbon neutrality and sustainability. 
Yusuf, I just want to say I love what I'm seeing here. It's fantastic. Can you, can you tell me what your role is here? I am the director of Mazar City Operation, where we are responsible to be sure that everything delivered as per our vision and our criteria and uh, design uh, guideline. We start to design the city and how we cannot do it. So we go back the history with our old Arabic cities where the streets are narrow and where's the shaded each other. And so we are using the same concept, but in, with the new modern technologies, whereas uh, the advanced technology came in. Our idea is to make the city is more as much as we can pedestrian friendly. One of the problems that people criticize with new buildings is the supply chain, where the materials come from, what you do with the building waste. Right. So one of the criteria we are using now that we have to find supplier or manufacturer where they have to do things locally. So we reduce the CO2 emission of transportation as well. So we are yeah. taking a lot of steps, not only for the production or the nature of the material, but also transportation and so on. So if you go inside Mazar City, you will see a lot of, uh, we have a recycle center where all the material used in the construction to be reused again right. within the building. So this one is uh, saving money as well as saving the environment by itself. At the end of the day, we have to think of the future as well. So uh, the future is uh, environmentally, uh, we have to be very environment. So we keep, we preserve these lands, this uh, earth to, to our future generation. So when they come in the future, they will see that, yes, we, we thought about them from now. We don't leave them just uh, in a polluted area. Yeah. Mazdar City is truly an amazing place. And I've still got so much more to learn about it. More and more cities are evolving to become more energy efficient, sustainable, and technologically advanced. These smart cities are adapting for an increase in population, so in order to accommodate future generations, changes must be made. With these changes in technology and ideas within creative minds, we are becoming closer to the idea of a utopia. It should be our focus to continue to foster new ways of thinking so that we can learn from our past take inspiration from legendary innovators, and strive towards the utopian ideal.